everybody, and welcome to another episode of Lost with Friends. As always, I'm your host, Paul, and my guests today, uh, I don't need to give them an introduction because they're so well-received. I'll just let them introduce themselves. Go ahead, guys. <laughs> All right, so I'll go first. I'm Andy. I'm Arthur. And I'm Andrew. We're all from England. Hey! Welcome back, guys. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, thanks, thanks for having us. Um, so we are going to be discussing the episode and found, and I don't want to hear any more comments from from Andrew over there about the fact that it's this episode, because <laughs> I'm pretty sure you guys asked for this one because it was a matter of. Uh, you know, oh, what episode don't you have somebody on or whatever? And this was one of the first that I had said. And I don't remember which one of you said it, but you were like, oh, we'll do that one. Yeah, no problem. So I know Andrew's going to have some sort of comment throughout the episode at some point, but I don't want to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I enjoyed the last Jim Sun episode so much that, um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to do this one. I think it's very much like the first one we did. It's kind of one of those ones that you don't really think about too much, but unexpectedly uh, very good. Yeah. Yeah, I watched it. I watched when I when I watched it. I was I was my hopes weren't that high. Well, of course I love most of the episodes, but I I kind of thought oh this episode I couldn't really remember much about it, and then I watched it. I was like this is actually a really good episode. Yeah, there's so many. I because I just got done watching it a little bit ago, and there's so many parts where like. You know, and uh, they always do, but like Locke has amazing parts, and it seemed to me the secondary characters. As much as I liked the the Jin and Son stuff, uh, I think we kind of talked about it the last time. The fact that their storyline doesn't really their their flashbacks don't really have much to them, other than they're Korean and her father doesn't like him, and you know what I mean, that kind of stuff. But I thought the episode overall was was a lot better than I remembered it being. I thought it was a great episode. Um, before we get into the actual episode, though, uh, previously, uh, when I believe it was the first time Andy was on, he mentioned that him and his brothers, Arthur, who's on the show this time, and Tony, when they were growing up all loving Lost, they would write each other Lost quizzes and see which one of them was the best. And they happened to find some... And so now Arthur is going to take over temporarily as the host of the Lost Quiz game show thing and see between Andrew, (laughs) Andy, and myself who has the knowledge. You're going down, both of you, just so you know. Yeah. Before we start fighting at all. Here we go. I'm going to lose here. I'm not going to ask all of them what I was saying, but I reckon my money's on pool for this. I don't know why. Even though Andrew... Andrew, Cheers, Arthur. You've got a bit of an advantage. (laughs) Andy's um, done this I just, I just want to say before we start, um, we do have to give a lot of credit here to my sister as well. It wasn't just the three of us. I know if she listens, she'll be annoyed that she wasn't included there, but she had a big part of it. She actually, uh, us being the three older dominant brothers, um, would often um, make her write it because obviously there's more fun in answering them than there is writing them. So, um yeah. Well then, bef- well, done, Alex. well then, before we we, yeah, we used- before we get into it, I would like to take a moment to apologize. I hadn't realized that, so I apologize to the Cornforth sister. Yeah, we even got round to paying her right near the end of doing Lost Quiz because she was she she was fed up with doing them. So we'd we'd all like get a few quid together to to give to her, so she <laughs> she'd write us another quiz because we enjoy it so much. <laughs> Bear in mind, she was probably about twelve. She was probably about twelve when we were doing it. So. <laughs> All right, so I've got a list of questions here. I probably am going to pick, maybe I'll do the first six. I'll give two questions each, and then we can, if there's a draw, we can maybe do a tiebreaker or something like that. Does that sound good, guys? Sounds perfect. Yep. Sounds good. All right, so I'll start with Paul, as you're the host. Your first question is, um, why was Desmond in Australia in the flash sideways? Ooh. How long, do, is there a timer on this? <laughs> Um, why was he in Australia? It's a given that you're not allowed to use the internet. No, again. no, I'm, yeah. <laughs> oh, I know, I know, I know. Of course you know. I, I honestly, <laughs> I don't remember. Can I say, Arthur? Yeah, you can say, I'll give you a bonus point if you get it. 
What? That wasn't said in the rules at the beginning, but go on. Well, he was oh, closing well, a, de- he was a, closing a deal, rules, wasn't he? He's so eager to know the answer. He's so eager he, to share. He was, what do you reckon was, it is, Andrew? He was closing the Mercado deal, right? Yes, you're right. He was closing the deal. Oh, oh yeah, baby! <laughs> <laughs> That's to be fair. I didn't know the answer to that. Oh, what nice, nice credit, one, mate. Give me some credit. What the f- is the Mikado deal? Something with Charles Widmore. Yeah, so the yeah, Charles. Something... Oh. What is it? The name of a company? Is it? Oh, I don't know. I think it was just like yeah. a fit, like McCutcheon. I think it was just a fictional thing. Yeah. You know, kind of like cool. the Tampa job with Sawyer. Just one of those things that we don't necessarily need to know. It's just the MacGuffin, yeah. if you will. Yeah. yeah. So I did well there. So now he has two yeah, points? Did, yeah. No, just one. Oh, okay. Um, so, um, Andy, I'll give you the next question. Two children survived on the tail, the plane's tail. Who were, what were their names? Oh, man, I, there, there was a day when this would have just come straight out of my mouth. Uh... <laughs> Damn. We see their feet in this episode as well. Yeah, we do. We see the bear. Yeah. Oh, man. I don't know. Anyone else know? Um, no. I'm an episode behind on knowing that, inf- on remembering that information. Yeah, man. <laughs> uh, oh. Zach? Zach is one. Oh, I remember yeah. the other one. Get off the mark for that. No idea what the word is. I remember is, with the other Lucy one. Or something? Lucy? I don't yeah. know. If I get it, do I get like a point as well or a half a point? <laughs> yeah, oh. half a point to you, half a point to Andy. If I'm not mistaken, it's Emma. Yes, that's right. Oh. Spot on. As soon as he said Zach, I went, oh, it's Zach and Emma. <laughs> 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 All right, so Andrew has a point and Andy and I each have half a point. Yeah. Yeah, but Andrew's still got a question to come for him. And it. Yeah, um, I'm just going to pick a good question because the next question's actually, it's got like multiple answers. So I think that'll be quite tough. Um, oh, who who was um, Cesar sitting to on the Ajira flight? Who was, who was Cesar sitting next to? Yeah. Uh, well, he was sitting opposite the aisle from Hurley. But sitting next to, ooh, Caesar. Yeah, I remember him saying something because he said Hurley said something to him. Put your seatbelt on or something like that. Um, all right. So who was on the plane? So it would have been either Sun, Kate. You are. You are. Hurley. It's probably the answer. <laughs> Yeah, I'll go with her. I know, dude. I'm over here practically ripping my yeah, beard right. out. Like, <laughs> it's like, yeah, what are you Hurley. trying to work out, mate? It's Hurley. Because <laughs> he even says at uh-huh. one point, this big man was sitting next to me and then he just disappeared. So it was Hurley, was it? Yeah, it was. There you go. I got the right answer. Oh, my yeah, God. You got two points. <laughs> I got two points. Yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Gotta um, love when the host even sighs. <laughs> yeah, I, I've got the answer right next to me. I was like, are you gonna, is that going to be your answer? Are you just going to keep thinking and not saying anything? But luckily he got, he got there in the end. Bless him. <laughs> um, I get bullied on this show. <laughs> You're winning. Stop complaining. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> okay, so I'll come back down to you, Paul. Um, what is the name who was Locke's assistant who helped him visit the Oceanic Six? Oh, the guy from Fringe. Um, I know. Oh, crap. I'm like the worst lost. I'm a host of a lost show. How do I not know this stuff? <laughs> I know, I know, I know. Um, wait, give me a second. I, I'll give Paul a I, yeah. I, give him like another no, ten no seconds. Clues, no clues, no clues. That's bullshit. Because <laughs> <laughs> all I can think of is is from Fringe. 
Oh, Abaddon. Matthew Freeze? Abaddon. Oh, boo! Yes. I was about to get a bonus point. Sorry. Because <laughs> I knew it was something <laughs> biblical. What's his name in What's his name in Fringe? Philip Broyles, oh, Colonel Philip Broyles. Oh yeah. I'm actually rewatching yeah. Fringe right now. That's why I could think of it off the top of my yeah. head. Good answer. So Paul's yeah. one and a half points. Andrew's two, and I'm on half. Yeah. Okay. So Andy. Oh. You, you mean he's got to get this one? Um. What song was the code to stop the transmission in the Looking Glass? Oh, I know this one. I, I know, know it. This, yeah, I know this one as well. <laughs> Beach Boys, Good Vibrations. Yes. Yeah, correct. Now, if my calculation is correct, right. um, Andrew's, Andrew's already won, hasn't he? Yes, he has. Well, you. <laughs> Andrew's already won. Yes, he has. He <laughs> away for the glory. Oh, no, not necessarily, actually, because you could, you could not know the answer to the next question. <clears throat> And someone can steal it. Yeah, true. All right, hit me with the question, Arthur. All right, so the final question. Andrew, whose candidate number was 15? Got it. Um, I think I know it. Ooh. Uh... Uh, four, eight, fifteen, sixteen, twenty-four, fourteen. Uh... <laughs> Such deep thought. Well, I know twenty-three, so that was not that one. Who's Wasn't... twenty-three? You may as well go through them, knock them off. Well, twenty-three uh, was I... twenty-three was Shepherd, wasn't it? Yeah. So fifteen. Uh, I'm Ford. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Yep. Sorry. Yes! I'm the champion of the lost quiz. <laughs> well done, man. Congratulations, well done. Andrew. You all underestimated me. No, you underestimated yourself. You were the one who claimed you were going to lose. Yeah, true. I killed that. That was good. I'm you proud did. of myself. Yeah. Very good. I'm going to go with Arthur. Arthur gave you the easy questions is what I'm going to go with. Oh, no, of course. The Mikado did. deal was well hard. <laughs> to be fair, you stole that one from but, me! But you're a Desmond fan, so you were going to get that one. Yeah. yeah. Were my Jack questions. Um, they, they weren't, they, there's only like one on here, and it was kind of a, it was a random number that you had to pick, so that was not, I wasn't going to ask that. Wait, cool. what? Well, well done, mate. No, it was, it was how many Jack-centric episodes were there. I was like, you're never, ever going to be able to work that out. I wanted to actually give you a question that you'd be able to work out. Well, how many are there? Or save it till the end of the episode so people have to keep listening. <laughs> they could just look okay. it up in the meantime. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> well, now I'm curious. How many? <laughs> uh, in my answers, I have 12. But I have a feeling it might be more than that. If it it's... depends if it includes... If it's including multi-centric or not, I suppose, isn't it? Yeah, yeah it does depend on that. If it's just solos, oh. 12 sounds about right. Mm, yeah. To a season. Yeah, I reckon that sounds about right. Sorry, I missed everything then, because I just had to go help Autumn with the remote. It wasn't that interesting. Oh, okay. Don't worry. Am I still the you champion? You have to wait. You're still, yeah, you're you still a champion, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but don't worry, I'll cut this all out, because it makes you look good, so I don't want it in my show. <laughs> there's, there's, that, there's, that, there's absolutely no way Andrew just went to help Autumn with the remote. Andrew went to gloat to Autumn that he just won a lost quiz. That's what happened. And she probably yeah, she already heard it. And she came in and started laughing, telling me to calm down. Yeah, I figured she would have like rolled her eyes and been like, "So." Yeah, I don't know. She doesn't care about that. <laughs> right, so should we crack on? Yeah. All right, here we go. We're gonna discuss the episode and found. That was good though. I like that. Yeah, I that was good, Arthur. Well done. Yes. Um, okay, so we start out with Son and Claire on the beach looking at the ocean, and I know Andrew just loved this scene. If it had, if it had included Shannon and Walt, it would have been perfect, right? Well, what, what, was, what was this scene? Sorry, I zoned out for a second there. I'm just posting a status saying I'm a lost champion. Oh my god! <laughs> Oh, 
Well, basically, in your, in all your glory, Paul was Paul was basically say, saying you're an anti-feminist. Oh, I, th- I didn't even hear it. Well, say it again, Paul, please. No, what I said was we start out with Son and Claire on the beach looking out at the ocean. And I said, if Shannon and Walt had been there, it would have been the perfect thing of, like, all the people you hate. No, I love Son. I thought you said you weren't a big fan. No, I love Son. I'm not a big fan of Claire, but I love Son. Okay, fair enough. You always put me on Son and Jin episodes. Yeah, there it was. I knew it was going to happen. First note. <laughs> um, Sun says how it's been four days, of course, four, one of the numbers. Um, and Claire comments how that actually isn't that long. I just, I, I watch that and I go, that's one of those things we talked about it previously, the fact that it's only been four days since the raft launched. Yeah, it was like this. I mean, not for you guys necessarily, but like it was the summer for for people in America, you know, and then the first few episodes, all of that. And all that time that, you know, normal viewing people would have had to wait to watch. And it's only been four days. Yeah. So compare that to a season of 24 when it's all been one day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. Sun is barely listening to her, however, uh, once she realizes that her wedding ring is missing. And she reverts back to speaking Korean as she's looking for it. And I I actually have a note later about how there's, like, in this episode, just the, the few Korean words that I know are from this episode. And I remember when I was first getting into the show, uh, and I would say to people, like, oh, yeah, I could speak a little Korean. And it's, like, three words. And I said, I could also, like, freak out like a married Korean lady and just be like, otake, otake, otake. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I always remember Iranji Shpopen. Yeah. <laughs> what does that mean? That's, like, 10 o'clock or something, isn't it? Remember, she went to, when the, her assistant is talking to her about when, when, what time she's going to escape. Or the driver will be there, and she's like, Iran, she's spoken. And she says it like four times in a row, and that always sticks with me. Yeah. So that's the only Korean I know. I know none. The one that I know from later on in this episode is how to say orange. Oh, yeah. Orange. Orange. Um, in flashback, Sun is getting dressed up for a date and her mother takes her shoe option away because the man may be shorter. And then in parentheses, I wrote Andrew. <laughs> I know, you do get bullied, mate. You really do. I know. Just because I'm a short ass. Bullshit this is. Well, no, because you said that the last time. You said about the fact that yeah. Autumn doesn't wear heels because if she did, she'd be taller than you. <laughs> This is true. I mean, she's having a, she's having a, I feel sorry for her. She's having such a hard time trying to find wedding shoes because she doesn't want to wear heels. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a nightmare. That is, uh, yeah, fair enough. She um, not, she, she not convinced you to get any shoes with a little bit of a heel on? No, nah, no, come on. I'm not, like, I'm not cool enough to carry a heel. I'm not going to wear Cuban, you know, Cuban heels. <laughs> um, going back to, uh, before the flashbacks, I did write a note just oh, saying how how terrible. That's right. Just how terrible it would be if you, if you did lose your wedding ring, even though it's it's basically an animate object. It just symbolizes so much when your husband is gone and you don't know whether he's alive or dead. I mean, in normal terms, um, if you lost your wedding ring, it wouldn't be that bad. You could just go get it replaced. But here, it's so much worse than losing it in a normal at home when you're not stuck in an island. Well, yeah, true. Yeah, and the, like normally, if you're at home, you think like, okay, yeah, maybe it could have gone down the drain, maybe it's in the garbage or whatever. But like, there's a finite number of places realistically that you can look for it. If it's there, if she dropped it on the beach, the ocean could have carried it away. Yeah, that's true. <clears throat> um, in the flashback, the mother basically says how since Sun went to college and wasn't able to find a man while she was there, she's now a bit older and considered silver instead of gold, and how if she waits too much longer, she'll be considered bronze. How horrible is that? Oh, Jesus, imagine what color it would be. 
She's pretty attractive in this scene, though. So, son or I'm her mother? Gonna... Come on, Paul. Her mother. <laughs> <or Paul. laughs> No, Sun, Sun no. wears really, really nice dresses throughout the whole episode, I noticed. Yeah, there's one dress in the second date she has with the guy, and she looks, woo, hello. Mm. <laughs> I, I wonder if the pressure to get married in Asian culture really is like that. I mean, I did spend six months in Asia earlier in the year, but I, I didn't really see any of the... We were, we were in a very different part of Asia, though. We definitely were, we definitely were. And I, I was wondering if, um, well, Andrew, obviously your mum's Filipino, did but yeah. you grew up in England. Did you have how much, um, like, I know it's completely different Asian, but uh, did you have much Asian culture, like, in, in, in uh, pressure for... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, every weekend we went to Filipino parties. Um, so that was interesting. And my mum always did try... She'd always... When we, I was a lot younger, she tried to set me up with Filipino girls. Um, yeah. But once I kind of got a bit older and went to university and kind of obviously stop listening to my mum so much <laughs> um yeah I, I i i mean i've never really found asian girls that attractive so yeah i always like the white chicks <laughs> i hope not the white chicks from white chicks because that'd be a no, no 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 not those not those white chicks they're actually black men <laughs> yeah <laughs> autumn just reminded me i did date a half black girl so there you go. And I didn't always like white girls. <laughs> um, and I, I wrote where, uh, you know, Sun, uh, it's, it, she kind of believes in finding love and finding the right person at the right time. Like, that seems to be the look that's on her face, especially, you know, in comparison to her mother being like, oh, it's all about age and, you know, did you go to college and this, that, and the other thing. But Mrs. – let's see if I can get it right this time. Peck. Correct. Yes. Uh, she says that Mr. Peck uh, says that the time is now. Um, and then we see elsewhere, Jin is getting dressed up as well. And his roommate is telling him how love will find him this year because what does he call it? The destiny book? Is that is that right? I don't know, but I loved this scene so much. I completely forgotten about it. And it's just so rare that we see the light-hearted fun gin like this. And yeah, even and it, there was a lot of humor from him as well, which is great. It's like, if I cut off the tag, how will I return it? I just, yeah, yeah. very rare. I, lo I love when he's like right before that, when he's doing the pose of like, how do I look? And he just like holds like, like his arms up in that particular way. I just, you know, how do I look? <laughs> yeah, he's just smiling the whole time. It makes me think actually, um, we all love Jun and Sin and Jun. Sin and Jun. I can't get it right. <laughs> Jim and Sun um, so much. But from what I can see, uh, as, soon, as soon as Jin meets Sun, he says he's happy, but you never see him smile again. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't, th I don't think that's so much her. I think that's her family. Yeah, yeah. Agreed, agreed. Yeah. They yeah, have I mean, strong love for each other. Which I, yeah. Sorry you know he's it's the father that causes that nothing to do with the uh, son herself um and of course Jin wants to know more about the woman that the book says and the roommate says orange which as i said is one of the only korean words i've ever learned from watching this show um and as Jin is leaving he uh makes sure to comment on the fact that he's not going on a date he's going on a job interview and then they make, I wrote it down as that classic TV joke about not cutting the tags off of clothing so that you can return it. That's, that's you. I mean, I love it. It's funny. Don't get me wrong. And like, like Andy said, it's nice to see Jin so lighthearted, but I, I every time I watch it now, I'm kind of just like, okay, this joke is in everything. <laughs> I've never seen that joke before. Maybe that's why I liked it. Oh, maybe I've never seen that. Maybe it was the first time. Maybe it's the first time I saw the joke. It was probably getting lost anyway. Yeah, maybe it's just an American thing, I guess, because we're all poor. <laughs> um, in the Aero Station, the Tailies appear to be having a meeting about the Raftermath group. Um, That's good. I like that. <laughs> That's what I've been calling them for the last few episodes, the Raftermath. <laughs> yeah, that was is good. Michael, I like that. Is Michael always wearing that orange T-shirt? Well, do you know in, the in thing? In my mind, it's all I see. I always it's see him in 
It's also interesting. Don't think it's interesting that he's also wearing orange. <laughs> I just think that's a coincidence. Yeah. yeah. Oh, wait, no yeah. coincidence no. on this show. Uh, coincidence in Lost. Yeah. yeah so I don't know. Good. I think there might be something in that. I don't know if I was reading too much into it, but I didn't notice that he was also wearing orange. I never I noticed that before. Too much into it. Yeah, but I always, it's like in my mind, I always see Michael in that orange T-shirt. So, yeah. Um, and Michael tries to calm Jin down by telling him that he'll see Sun again, and he then tells Sawyer about the tail he's trying to figure out what to do with these guys. And I love Sawyer's joke of like, maybe they're gonna eat us. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> I, I I don't know because I didn't watch it when it was on, so you guys would know. Was wasn't that maybe not maybe that was more the others? But I think I read somewhere that at one point people thought either the Tailies or the others were cannibalistic. Uh, I don't know if I ever thought that. I suppose it's a theory that most likely could have popped up quite easily over like a summer of missing lost or in in between a couple of episodes where there's just a random theory going around on a website so it makes it makes sense but i don't think i ever knew about it okay um anna lucia then says that they're moving on uh they need to go out and get food and water and they're going to start a trek back to the main survivors she says you know back where you came from um <clears throat> In the jungle with the tailies, they set off, and Ana Lucia tells them they all need to travel in pairs, and she splits them all up. Uh, she said, you know, yeah. so-and-so, they're going to go fishing, they're going to do this thing and that thing and whatever. And I, I was funny, though, because as I'm watching it, she said about, oh, they need to go out in pairs, and then it would have been, it appeared that it would have been Sawyer and Jin in a pair and then she said uh that you know she says something about fishing and then sawyer's like oh take him to go fishing and then that would have been three and one so like her logic went right out the window i think she knew that sawyer wasn't gonna be fit enough to go but, but anyway my point here was my note because you are all jack bashers from the last episode as we all remember that's <laughs> You think Jack's a controlling leader? What about Annalise? She's awful, demanding everybody everywhere. Oh yeah, no, so, she's yeah, uh, she's bad. But at this point, there's a, there's. The thing is, I thought. Sorry, Arthur, you Don't continue. Think. Well, I was I was just gonna say I thought when when I when I look back at this, I think oh I really like Annalise, but then when I'm watching this episode with her, and she's just like not not she's not likable at all really, especially as she's. She's bashing around like um whatever what did Paul call them a second ago the raft the raft them are those, those people when she's like telling them what to do and stuff she's just I just don't like her in in this yeah. episode I love how your it's, accent matches she's actually met her she'd be a nasty person let's remember though she did kill Shannon oh yeah oh all yeah love, all love no, comes back now like. <laughs> all love <laughs> right in the chest right in the chest. <laughs> Almost as if she was aiming for her. I'm that way, I'm that way. Um, but yeah, no, I would, I would definitely agree. Uh, she's not a great leader either. Um, but of course, now <clears throat> the difference is not saying that I'm necessarily in favor of her because I would definitely want Jack as a leader more than her. But we, of course, are supposed to be thinking, you know, obviously something happened. You know, to the point where somebody had to be step up and be this controlling. We know that there had been, tw you know, Libby claims that there had been 23 of them. They saw these people that they saw, you know, uh, Michael, Jin and Sawyer and immediately threw them in the pit and tied, you know, tied them up and this, that and the other. So clearly they're scared about something. And oftentimes, which I guess did happen with our main survivors, oftentimes, when everybody's scared, they need that one person to kind of step up and be like, I'm going to take charge. And it just so happened to have been her, whether that's good or bad, you know, it is what it is. Mr. Echo much better suited in my eyes, but I know he had his like 40 days of silence, so it wouldn't have worked very well before then. Yeah. Oh, could you imagine trying to be led by like a silent... But he's very intimidating, though, so... 
Yeah. If Mr. Echo so awesome, I'm sure he could have done it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, at the Survivor Beach, Sun is looking through her belongings to try and find her wedding ring. And Jack realizes she's frantic and he goes to talk to her. She tells him what happened, and he tells a story about how when he was married, he lost his ring, and he looked everywhere, couldn't find it, and she never found, uh, um, Sarah never found out because he went and got a replica made. And all I could think of was, funny story doesn't really help in her situation, though. Yeah, well, my, I, I just love this bit. I was saying, these are like my favorite types of episodes, watching them back for the nth time. Just the reason being, you just get to watch the characters interact in their everyday beach lives. And you get to listen to Jack, who's normally all like uptight and controlling, or like you say, uh, even though he's awesome. Um, but you get to listen to him <laughs> tell a story about losing his wedding ring. Um, like, like Trisha Tanaka is Dead is another great example of just getting to watch the characters interact with each other without too much high drama going on. And... Uh, some say the early seasons have too many filler episodes, um, but I would actually say, like looking back, obviously you want more material. I would say the later episodes don't have enough. They get lost in um, these in the moments of just constant high drama. They don't have enough of that take a chill pill moment like we get in these. The thing is, they they do well in 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 relation relation to filler episodes. It's not exactly a filler episode. It's just like parts of like one like let's say story story arc of the episode and um then again it's uh, what's i gonna say yeah i think it's just because people pe- when, when people watch lost it was like everybody was addicted to the mystery they wanted questions they wanted answers as soon as they got an episode where it was about the characters and they didn't get a new question or they didn't get a new answer they sort of threw it through it in the in the bin saying it's like a filler episode nothing happened here it's like no you got to watch you got to see your favorite characters um, in this calm environment. I just, I, I just love it. Well, uh, yeah, it helps the, the the character development overall as well. Because if they're just doing actiony stuff all the time, you you are going to hate people like Kate, who kind of has a slightly annoying personality when it comes to the main storylines. But in this kind of episode and thing, she's lovely, isn't she? Yeah. You guys summed it up perfectly. I, I have nothing to add. Um, Kudos. <laughs> um, Jack then offers to help her, uh, but she, you know, she doesn't. She refuses his help. Um, back with the Tailies, Jin is just sitting back. Do I just? I, this is one of my favorite scenes. I wouldn't necessarily classify it as the the put down the phone moment scene, but I just love that he's just sitting there. I don't know what exactly he's doing, but like he's plucking those little things off and just throwing them in the water. And Ana Lucia and Bernard are there the entire time. And she does that thing that all the characters seem to do. And pretty much anybody who doesn't speak the same language as someone else seems to do. Mostly people who speak uh, English or American, really. Uh, You know, talk slower and louder because suddenly that will make everything more clear for some reason. And she's like... Ask any of my friends... And I am terrible at that, and it's so embarrassing. I try not to be, but give me a, give me a beer or two, and there I am, trying doing exactly the same thing, <laughs> making a tit out of myself, being an English tourist. Um, but yeah. But yeah, she's just there, and she's like mimicking like fish and eat, and she's just so mad at him. And then he just like throws the net in the water, and. He just he pulls out like a bunch of fish that they could, you know, he all he did, like I said, he threw these little things in whatever else he did. And he catches several fish. And I I just love what he just looks at her and just goes fish. (laughs) Yeah, Asians can do stuff like that. (laughs) You good. That is what we do. You good at fishing? I'm really, really not. No, I've never, I've actually only been fishing once in my entire life. I did catch a fish though, but that's, uh, you know, by did the you way. Did you eat it or put it back? Uh, no, was we it, ate was it. Was it a goldfish around your mate's house in the bowl? <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> no it, was a, it, was a, it was a legit fish. Nice. And we ate it, it was tasty, it was good. Yeah, yeah, we ate it. Did you clean it out and all yeah. that stuff too? 
Oh, no, 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 no. I didn't do or gut it or anything like that. I just caught it and then had a picture taken with it and then someone gut it and then we cooked it. Okay. Um, but it's been good. Um, in flashback at Jin's job interview, the interviewer, uh, patronizes or patronizes, uh, Jin for his lower class status and the tag hanging off his tie. So of course that's a nice little, uh, callback. And that scene, as I, as much as I said, you know, the, oh, I got to hide the tag seems to happen a lot, at least in American shows that happens about half the time as well where the person find you know the person who you're trying to hide the tag from finds it and they rip it off and it's kind of like an embarrassing moment but for the moment at least things turn out okay um because Jin still stays ah. respectful and then the man gives Jin the job before insulting him one last time by saying that the Seoul Gateway Hotel is prestigious and not to let anyone of Jin's own lower class in. Horrible. Yeah, I feel really bad for him because I just... It just further adds why he's such an angry person. <laughs> yeah, it does. I mean, what you don't ask for a raise or time off. I don't want to work for this employer. It's not even a particularly good job. I don't... Uh, why does he want to work for him so much? He's, uh, and um, why do they portray every um, like rich Korean person to be to be mean and angry? It's, <laughs> I hope it's not really like that, but they don't. They do a good job of making us think. Well, I mean, realistically, yeah. though, in most anything, most rich people tend to be the villains because you know what I mean it's the whole working class versus you know the white collar people kind of thing I guess yeah I think we've would got you, would, some you, nice would you all consider yourself working class no I wouldn't what, what, yeah, what is working class am I working class no you're not well what do you consider working class then that's what I mean. I'm trying to. Cons- th- I'm trying to because I, I would consider myself working class. Well, maybe you are. I don't know. What did your parents? It's just, oh, it mainly mainly comes down to, well, how much money? What? How much money do you have? I don't know. What did your parents do for their job? Like, were you my always dad, struggling? Dad, my dad was a postman. My mum was a nurse. Yeah, but he's he's a he's a grown man in his own right. He's getting ready to get married. He's like out in the world, so it doesn't necessarily go by what his parents did anymore. At this at this age. Thank you, Paul. See, I don't always insult you. I got your back, bro. <laughs> uh, you're poor just like the rest of us, Andrew. Don't worry. <laughs> No, I, 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 I'm coming yeah, across I, as the, I'm coming across as the mean one because I just said Arthur and I are middle class. You guys are middle class. You're really, you're lovely people though, which makes which makes me happy. Thanks. Yeah, we are from Winchester. Yeah, we can't. Yeah, really you're, that. yeah, you're from Winchester. You're middle class. The funny thing is though, because we're from Winchester, we I actually like in comparison to our some of my friends, it's like I'm just I'm not, barely consider myself middle class half the time. Well, are they really poor? Oh, uh, just yeah, basically. Are they? <laughs> I mean, we went to we went to state schools, so we we uh, I don't know what it's called and how that works in America. Like in England, we've got three types of schools: basically state, which is just the normal ones, private, where you pay, and then public, which probably contradicts what you think in America. But public is like stupidly rich, and you have to like be really clever to go to. I went to a state school. Yeah. Okay, so a state yeah. school for you guys is a public school for us. Yeah, like public for us is yeah. like proper rich. Yeah. Okay. Um, in the jungle, Michael and Libby are walking, and Michael says how Jin is his friend, but he never really thought of Sawyer that way. Which I yeah. thought that they had kind of squashed that by this point. Well, I thought of the other around. I said, he said... I guess one of them is my friend, not the redneck. And then I said, I thought to myself, hold on. Michael's had more confrontations with Jim than he has Sawyer. I know he's just had one with Sawyer on the raft with the bullet, but that was, I, I don't know if you can really count that as a normal confrontation. But 
I know as it goes on, Michael is kind of better friends with Jim, but I think at this point, really, uh, he's more likely to consider Sawyer a friend than Jim. Yeah. yeah. See, I think I'd, I'd think that he was his kid on the raft, and him being with Sawyer is just puts all that. I think he'll hate, he doesn't like Sawyer, basically, is what I'm saying, especially after that incident. Um, and then when you when you go back to the, the gin friendship and whatever, you can see that they've, they've they've kind of like structured it through, well, the first few, couple, well, two seasons of Lost where Michael was in it. It's just like their, their friendship evolves. You can see it evolving where with, with Sawyer. It's not so much like that, I don't think. Yeah, well, Sawyer doesn't really have a good relationship with anything. Um, Libby comments that she knows about being scared and how scared plus trust issues amongst the Tailies is why uh, they threw the, the three rafter math people in the pit. And I, I don't know. I look back at that when she's just like, you know, oh, I know about being scared. And I, I, I look at it from two points of view, and one is like, okay, we still don't know what the deal is with these tailies, and the other is, oh, maybe that's setting up something about her backstory, which is pretty much, I don't want to say it's never paid off, but it just bugs me how little they paid her her story off. Yeah, but you can do, you already, from knowing her flashback, her limited flashback in the future episodes, you can see that she's... Well, she's in a mental institution, so she's obviously going to have that sort of insecurity about her. But there was a, a bit she said here, which she said, I've never seen anyone so scary in my life, talking about Sawyer. And I'd never noticed that line before, and I found it very strange. It made me think she was a bit of a psycho. <laughs> well, yeah, because Mr. Echo is scarier than Sawyer. Yeah, Mr. Echo is far scarier, especially the others in the middle of the night and stuff. That must be far scarier than seeing sarcastic man with long hair he's been shot <laughs> um <laughs> michael and he's good looking and he's good looking as well so you'd think it wouldn't be that scary um michael then asks why they don't go more inland for food as that's where the other survivors the original uh survivors uh, have gone, and Libby says that they don't go that way because that's where they come from. <clears throat> Obviously, Michael runs. <laughs> um, and then we see with the other tailies, Mr. Echo gives Sawyer a blade for his protection when they travel. And I just, I love Sawyer's like incredibly scared reaction, which does kind of play off of what you were just saying, Andy, about like how he's not scary at all. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then they, in, you know, he introduces himself and he says that his name is Mr. Echo and Sawyer asks if that's like Mr. Ed and that makes me laugh every time. But I'm guessing no, that mean. joke doesn't play for you guys. No, I, 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 I kind of just skip over it. I'm not even sure what it means. I don't know who Mr. Ed is either. Mr. Ed. Yeah, that's what I mean. It's a, it's an old like black and white TV show from. It's not like really like a clever joke. It's uh, assume you know it's pretty much just because Echo and Ed have the same E sound, but it's an old black and white show from has to be the '60s or earlier where it was a guy who was a, like a farmer and he had a talking horse named Mr. Ed. Oh, it's interesting because Mr. Ed was also mentioned in Armageddon. Okay. It just, it just, it just came to me. Like I, I remember it being mentioned in that movie too. And I was just interested to know the context of why, who is this person? Yeah, not a person, it's a horse. Because they would... Oh. They, wow. they would put peanut butter in the horse's mouth so that it would chew, you know, and like move its lips. And then they would slow down yeah. and speed it up so that it they and then they would take somebody and mat like use a voiceover and match the words to it. So it looked like the horse was actually speaking. It was really good for the time. I'm to I'm not totally out of sync with American TV culture. I do get the chewy reference later on. Right. But yeah, that was, that's, that's what that is. And just because I know, maybe it's just because I know what it is and, and I've seen episodes of that show. It just makes me laugh. Um, 
And then Libby runs in to tell everyone that Michael ran off into the jungle. And Jin says a bunch of things in Korean before saying Walt. And I wrote, Sawyer gets that one. <laughs> that's the... uh, every time I hear Walt, it just makes me laugh. Because it's kind, it kind of annoying. You get, especially later on. you do. There, it gets to a point where you're just fed up of hearing somebody go, Walt! Walt! It does get a bit ill. I don't know if you... I don't know if you remember at the costume party uh, in Lost 2014. There was was it someone dressed up as Michael who spent the whole time just walking around shouting Walt as well? That was pretty funny. Yeah. I think that, that was Rudy. Funny. Yeah, it might well have been actually. I think it was. Um, was he black? Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah he was. Um, see, Jake has a thing where he keeps commenting because he did the orientation episode, and he said he's like, "Did you notice what else he says all the time?" Because he he said it in the finale. And uh, he said it in the orientation one and whatever. Like almost any time, the first thing when he wakes up in these in these few episodes, it's not Walt. It's where's my boy? Like that's his other his his secondary catchphrase, if you will. <laughs> where's my boy? <laughs> <laughs> um. And Ana Lucia says that they need to move out uh, because they don't need Michael telling the others where they are and she asks Libby and Cindy to grab a few things including a radio and Sawyer is interested in the radio but um Anna's just you know suggests because he's like oh you know have you used it and she's like oh gee what a great idea Did anybody enjoy our sarcasm oh it's awful no yeah um, no. I mean, maybe the first time I watched it, I was like, you know, huh, but not like, I didn't like laugh hysterically at it. Thing is, it's not, it's not funny sarcasm though, is it? She's, she's doing it to kind of like prove a point. Yeah. Which well, is isn't... It, it's part of her character. I, I can see it. Yeah. She, she doesn't have much to her. That's what, one of her two bullet points probably is, uh, make her sarcastic. Like for the writers, it's like make her sarcastic and make her bossy. That's about her. That's about her character, isn't it? Yeah. That pretty much yeah. sums her up. Yeah. <laughs> um, but Jin wants to go after Michael, and even Sawyer agrees that they won't be able to convince him to come back because he's too interested in getting Walt. And then Sawyer comments that it's every man for himself. And as much, uh, as much as Michael wants Walt, Sawyer wants to uh, focus on his own shoulder. And I just love that kind of thing where, you know, it's every man for himself because it's the opposite of Jack's whole thing the entire time of it's not every man for himself. It's live together, die alone. But then Sawyer, yeah. every time, you know, Sawyer every so often, he's just like, it's every man for himself because he doesn't get that group community mentality thing yeah and even more it did read into that even further obviously season three episode four is titled every man for himself and it's a sawyer centric episode it's a very prominent theme that what you just said a difference between sawyer and jack yep i'd still put sawyer above jack on my favorite characters list paul <laughs> what tread we don't care- need to start another tread- argument tread Carefully. <laughs> Everyone's entitled to their own opinion, Andy. Yeah, they are. I'm Jake. I like Sawyer. I'm pretty sure he used to be your favourite character, didn't he? Oh, Sawyer was my favourite character for a long time. But Sawyer was my favourite character when I watched Lost. Only watching it back after season six, Jack became my favourite character. Yeah. Is that because you yeah, realised but... like 100% yeah, so... that the show does focus on him? Yeah, basically, as soon as you realize Jack is the most important, and well, and I just, yeah, I've said so many times before in this podcast, but as soon as you see the season five Jack, where he's so broken, and the season six Jack, where he's found his faith, I just can't look past him. I can't fit to look at any other character because it, it's so good. It, just that development. But yeah, we've spoken about it a lot on this show. Fair enough. Um,. Jin starts to go off, and he and Mr. Echo trade headbutts before Echo finally tells Jin the right way to go. He gives him a weapon, and he decides to tag along to help. 
I just love that. I don't know if that was supposed to be like, you know, just a show of strength between these two or just, you know, a matter of I'm going and I need to like maybe maybe Mr. Echo needed Jin to prove that he could have gone on his own because it's it's that thing, you know, every we've talked about it before where uh, you know, um Jin doesn't look that intimidating, but once you get him going, like he'll beat the crap out of you, you know? So I think maybe Mr. Echo kind of needed that sort of, you know, for Jin or, you know, to kind of initiate that for Mr. Echo to be like, maybe this guy can handle himself. Maybe he is somebody that I want to, you know, help out. Echo is just hard as nails. I don't think watching this for the first time, I don't think I ever thought anybody was quite as cool as you think Echo is in this episode. Proper oh, man. Echo. Proper man crush. On Echo? Yeah. He's a beast, man. Really? He, he would destroy you. <laughs> Andrew, please, tone it down. <laughs> <laughs> He's a big man. He is a big man. Yeah. <laughs> And we o- we only ever like- we only ever see him in in uh, trousers. So how can you know if he has the legs like Shannon? <laughs> this has gone too far, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Andy likes him for a different reason because he's big and strong. Yeah, someone who can hold him hit hold him. <laughs> oh, is that That's what Andrew is that, needs when he gets all emotional? Is that Andrew? You should, is that what yes. it is? Uh, he's he's don't so used to. Don't turn it on me. We don't turn it on me. <laughs> no, no, no. I was just gonna say, uh, tagging up on what Arthur said. Is that is that why Andy likes him? Because he's so used to like you know he's the oldest brother and he was such a rebel and a bully and all that kind of stuff in school that now he wants to be dominated. Guys, seriously, this is ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh. Andy, Andy, I think Andy would look tiny inside Mr. Echo's arms. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Come on, right, so you're telling me. All right. I love how you're about ready to defend it. <laughs> it no, I'm, I, I'm not defending myself. I'd love to be in Mr. Echo's arms. I'm saying, who's your, who's your man crush out of all the lost characters? Who's your man crush on? And you're not allowed to say Desmond. You've got to hear someone else. We know, we know who Andrews is on. Yeah, he's not allowed to be Desmond. It's got to be somebody else. All right. Well, it is Desmond, but I think I think it's someone else. Um, like someone you think's really cool. It's like, I just want to... You see him wear a T-shirt. It's like, oh, I want to wear that T-shirt. Or like, he does something cool. I'm going to do that. He says a word. He's got a catchphrase. I'm going to use that catchphrase. Hmm. Good question. See, I really like Jim. He's, what catchphrase are you going to use of gins? Pardon? What catchphrase are you going to use of gins? Uh, I, I don't know. Some Korean. <laughs> Maybe wait until he can speak proper proper English. But he he is he's a bit like Mr. Echo in the fact that he is he is quite big and strong and and he's, he looks lovely. He's, in like, his he's you look lovely in his heart. and he's romantic towards <laughs> Sunny. I'm worried oh. about you two. <laughs> You're the one who bloody said it. <laughs> no, I, I, I think um, who have we got to choose from again? Throw some names at me. What? No. You, 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 got you don't Jack, know the Charlie guys Curly. on the show by now. Hey, I won the lost quiz. So then you should be uh, able to answer this easily. I'd, I'd probably go with uh, Sawyer. Yeah, that's fair enough. Just because he, yeah, he's just, I don't know, he's cool. But he might it? be conning you. You've got to be careful. He might no, be, he might no, be no, 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 no. I'd, I'd yeah. see through it. Yeah, try and get you into bed just for your money, Andrew. <laughs> oh, that's a picture, isn't it? He hasn't got any money to give. <laughs> True story. They just didn't find it very funny, apparently, yeah. I, mean, I felt sorry for you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, who's your man crush on? Oh, it would have to be Richard or Sawyer. Richard. Richard's my. You go for the, old... He's... Go for the older men, do you? I like older women, so why not? <laughs> um, Ana Lucia doesn't think it's a good idea 
for Mr. Echo and Jin to go off, but he says that he's going to help Jin find his friend. I wrote clearly these two, meaning Ana Lucia and Echo, have some sort of special bond. Um, on the beach, Hurley and Son are retracing her steps, and Hurley latches on to the idea that Vincent the dog ate the ring, and they then sit there and wait for the dog to pass the ring that they think he swallowed. And I just, I love this scene. Like, Sun gets the attention of all of the major people in this episode, by the way. Yeah, she does. She has she has moments with all the major male characters. Well, not even just the male ones. Like, her and Kate, I mean, I know they have a lot of moments throughout the thing, but, like, her and Kate have some pretty good moments in this one, too. Yeah, I comment. She starts off with Cloud as well. Yeah. Well, no, um, I. What was the comment? What would who? What bit did you just say? Because I wasn't listening. I was on my phone. Who? Hurley bit. The Hurley bit. Did he? Did you comment on the bit about which career was it? Nope, that was what I was just <laughs> about to say. Okay, say that, and I've got something to say about it. Um, I, you know, uh, they then sit there and wait for the dog to pass the ring that they think he swallowed. I, I wrote, I love while making small talk. Hurley asks if Soul is in the good Korea or the bad Korea. It cracks me up, and I, I just love her kind of like hesitation or confusion where she's just like the good one <laughs> yeah what i found funny about that especially was that he knew that it Seoul held an olympics but he didn't know whether it was the secretive communist country or not i just found that very strange <laughs> well you know uh we like we uh off mic we had talked about you know the fact that like america isn't in the top 10 uh internet speeds i read a thing where uh north korea actually has like one of the, and I mean, granted, because they may be forced to give it X number of stars on whatever the North Korean version of Yelp is, but they actually have one of like the fanciest hotels in the world there. Oh yeah, North Korea is all probably awesome inside. I mean, they, they spend a lot to make themselves look good. My, uh, well, one of Autumn's really good friends has actually been to North Korea and, uh, yeah, he said it was just like fascinating. It was he he kind of he said it was a very just just strange, yeah, but really cool place to visit. If we ever get if you ever get the chance, you should go. Yeah, hmm. so. it would be cool. I looked up the Seoul Olympics as well because I was interested, and it was held in uh, 1988, and the Soviet Union won it with 55 golds. East Germany second, and the USA came third. And uh, the, uh, the host nation fourth. Great Britain didn't even make the top ten, unfortunately. Um, she then says, uh, Sun then says how embarrassing it is that this, waiting for the dog to take a crap, is what they're doing. But he says how his dog once crapped out, what did he say? It was like a, a buck 85 in nickels or something? <laughs> hmm. Arthur, do you remember dad telling the story where he at once ate a penny? And Granddad made made him look through his shit until he found it. I do actually remember. He, he's, he's definitely told that story a few times. Yeah, For a penny? No, like just to make sure it'd come out of him. Like make sure the penny wasn't like still in it. Because obviously, if you eat a coin and like it doesn't come out, you might want to go to hospital. <laughs> You've got a penny <laughs> stuck in you somewhere. Oh, I thought it was just like we need that penny to you know to pay the bills or something. <laughs> <laughs> middle class I don't need pennies uh. <laughs> um, and Sun then says that uh, Jin once gave her a dog name I don't know I'm going to butcher the name but I believe it was Popo which means a kiss Popo. yeah cute that's also some Korean we know now yep say it yeah. you say it oh yeah Popo okay I mean, that comes straight off the first Lost With Friends that we did, where Jin steals the dog. Yeah. Or gets given the dog, sorry. He doesn't steal it. He gets, he gets given it as a gift. He does. Um, in flashback, Mrs. Peck is telling her daughter uh, to basically be the classic idea of the perfect model Asian woman by not talking about her degree or really not talking at all unless she's asked something directly. Um, it just, that just bugs me so much. Um, 
And the matchmaker then says how the man is handsome, educated, and his family owns that hotel and many others. And as they're going in, who happens to be the doorman holding open the door and welcoming them to the Soul Gateway Hotel but Jin Su Kwan. And he looks sharp as hell in that outfit. He does. Yep. He looks good. Um, I think you got a man crush on him instead. Who, Jin? Mm. Yeah, to be fair, have we all seen the... Well, we've obviously all seen it, but uh, I don't know what... I think it's coming up soon, isn't it, when they come back, but when Jin comes out the tent with his top off. Yeah. Come on now. That is yeah. some chest right there. <clears throat> we do all want a body like that. Got oh one. yeah, damn right. Jin's got Jin. Jin's ripped. Ripped like yeah, yeah. He's got it all going on. Um, we then <laughs> see the character of Jay Lee for the very first time as his mother and son's mother discuss their children. And then they leave so that Sun and Jay can start to talk to each other. And Jay asks about being pressured by the parents and the fact that they share this in common. And they start to bond and they tell what each other studied uh, in college. And Jay mentions how somehow he ended up in hotel management. And I love Sun's sarcastic response of, yeah, somehow. Yeah. I found this conversation a bit boring. All I noticed was how big the table was and how far away they were from one another. <laughs> yeah, that was strange. Why were they so far away from each other? You definitely want it to be more intimate, wouldn't you? You would on a date. On a first date, for sure. I don't think so, though, because they didn't know each other. Like, their moms were there the first time. Would you really want it to be, like, you know, that close? Because you're nervous. You know, yeah, it's very di- it's very difficult to flirt with somebody unless they're right next to you. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, you can't do the you know the sort of yeah. You can give them a few odd looks and stuff, but that that doesn't work. You need to be able to you know. I wouldn't know. I have no moves, and ladies aren't interested in me anyway. So. No, oh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll yeah. get we'll get you one uh, in Hawaii. We'll, I'm gonna we'll find you a girl. smoking hot hula hula girl. <laughs> Jay then says how, for the first time, he's actually enjoying one of these setups, and she says that she is as well. So, as much as you know, you, you know, you said maybe you didn't find anything except the table, uh, whatever. I always like this scene because it's kind of you know we always think of Jin and Son together, so to kind of see her being happy like that with someone else, it's like, oh well, wait a minute, it's nice for her. But that's not who she's supposed to be with. Yeah, she's supposed to be with Jin. Yeah. Um, but he's too busy holding open the door for her. And not in like a gentlemanly kind of way. Just like the I've got to do it way. Yeah. <laughs> um, in the jungle, Echo and Jin are looking for Michael. Uh, Jin hears some rustling and is attacked by a boar before happening upon the corpse of a man Echo confirms was named Goodwin. And I just love Jin asks others, and Echo just nods in agreement. <laughs> so I just love how at this point we, uh, knowing what's going to come in the future, I love how we're kind of thinking, oh, the others killed one of them, i.e. the Oceanic people. But in reality, obviously, we find out that Goodwin was one of them. So when he says others, that's our natural assumption is that he was killed by them, but he obviously wasn't. Right. It was also the first bit, well, it's something we got to see as to why they were so scared and why it's a lot different. It's like two completely different places over on the other side of the island. Yeah, because, yeah, because they didn't, they like, our regular survivors, the regular Losties, they didn't come across, you know, we didn't see anything with, like, a, a dead body like this until the whole Ethan thing. Why did they, do you reckon that they decide to attack them and not our losties kids there was less of them i'm thinking i don't really know they try, why. They kill, they, i think they i think our survivors killed ethan off too early i think they probably would have but um they ethan died too early and um they obviously couldn't infiltrate another one they attacked them on the first night the list 
The names were on the list. Yeah, I don't know. I don't have another answer for you, I'm afraid. Maybe it was closer to, the, you, to that you guys... You're lost, champion. You should know it all, mate. Yeah. We all know that was a fluke. Oh, and on. now I got him on record saying it. <laughs> <laughs> but I won. <laughs> Yeah. Boris, no Boris still survived, and that was a fluke. Oh, bloody here we go. <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> Get back in Echo's arms. <laughs> um, Taking a break, they try and exchange small talk, and, you know, Echo says about, you know, oh, you're married and whatever, and when Jin asks if Echo is married, he says, worse. Which kind of bugs me. Oh, is that what he says? Because my note here, I thought he said was. I said, Echo says he was married. I know, don't remember that. And we never saw that either. But if he said worst, uh, maybe. What, what does that mean? Yeah, what is worst? I'm pretty sure he said was. I, th- I thought he said was. I thought he said worse. Yeah. Well, let's look up. I don't think the... I don't think he said was. Well, he wasn't what? married because we would have seen that. And it, we, yeah, he exactly. wasn't married. I... So, but yeah, that, that's what I got. I thought, he said... I thought he said worst as well. Yeah, no, I've got the lost champion on my side, so we win. That's damn straight. Well, I wasn't involved in the quiz, so I could technically be the lost champion. I got lost I knew, Pedia's I knew transcript answers. up here, which of course is you know user generated, but it also says it says Echo says worse. Okay, well, what does he mean by that? I don't know. That's why that bugs me. Maybe what do you think it could mean? What do you think? Because, I mean, what? Okay, you know what yeah. I think? I think it's yeah. uh, because he's still kind of trying to play it up as if he's a priest. And they don't say it necessarily in the priesthood as much, but, like, they say, you know, nuns are married to Jesus. Kind of priests are, are on a lot of the same, you know, vows of poverty and celibacy and all that kind of stuff. So I think maybe he's just trying to play up that that concept. Yeah, I'll give you that. And I, I wrote down that I also noticed how he doesn't try to over communicate with Jin like everyone else. He asks for Sun's name and then he's just, you know, he, uh, Jin looks at him like, I don't know what you mean. And then he just says her name. And like, it's just that deep, almost monotone voice. Like he just, he doesn't, care to try to be like name you know (laughs) um in sun's garden she's looking for her ring and begins ripping up the different plants in frustration and while she's crying Locke finds her and i just love his simple bad day before he gives her something to wipe her eyes and she asks if he saw her and he's just like what ripping apart your garden no (laughs) Love All that. that hard work she put into her garden as well. Well, it's not the, well, is that the first time it gets ripped up? But it does get ripped up again, doesn't it? Jin, Jin's ripped it up before. Has right. he already ripped it up? He yeah. has, hasn't he? Uh, but yeah, and then John pops up. And I, we've already all touched upon it already. But how often do we get to see the two protagonists, Jack and John, in relaxed environments and conversations with people? Well, it's not even the two protagonists. We, we also have... Kate having conversations, Hurley, Claire, it's just, it's just brilliant. Yeah, it was nice. It was nice for the character of Sun. She, she got some attention from everybody else. Um, yeah, I'm actually not as bothered about Sun in these moments. It's more about the people she's interacting with. It just gives me a nice feeling inside that you get to see all these characters. Um, well, I don't know if you guys noticed. I, I, I admit I had to look. I had to see it on Lostpedia. But this is the first episode so far this season that we see nothing of the hatch. Yeah, I read that on Lostpedia too. I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, and then uh, Locke says how he used to get very angry, but doesn't anymore because he's not lost. And she asks how. And he says, the same way anything lost gets found, you stop looking for it. And while he's doing this, we see at the very end that he's putting one of her plants back in the ground. I thought that was very sweet. And I would probably classify this 
scene with the two of them, Locke and Son, as my put down the phone moment for the episode. Yeah, it's such profound words from Locke. He's 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 awesome sometimes. I think he's, he he's very good at giving advice to people. Very. He is. But then again, I, I, I read the, the words that he said again. He said he, he doesn't get, he doesn't get angry anymore, uh, but he de- definitely still gets frustrated, I think. Oh, he gets that more he... angry. He gets angrier than anybody else. Yeah, yeah I know. <laughs> but again, as Andy has said in the past, well. he kind of needs to play it up because all of them don't know how full of crap he is. So he needs yeah. to kind of play to yeah. all of them of like, yeah, I'm I'm the calm, cool collected i know everything that's happening you know the island will 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 try you know we trust the island sort of guy yeah yeah for sure um in flashback sun is looking very fancy while she's out to eat waiting for jay and outside Jin and jay talk and Jay asks for Jin uh, for the flower that Jin has pinned so that he could give it to his date. And I wrote, Jin is just happy the boss asked for his name. Yeah, that was a nice moment. That was actually, I, it, I can see why uh, some would like this guy because he actually is quite a nice guy. Well, yeah, because especially, uh, you know, I see it on TV a lot where like rich people or you know kids of rich people maybe the corn forts can understand this um (laughs) that's so not true (laughs) um but where they're just like you know they don't necessarily want to hang out with any other kids of rich people because they think that they're all snotty you know what i mean and they're just like oh i'm the only one who's down to earth And now I think she's kind of felt like she's met someone who comes from the same background, as you said, but he's also very down to earth, which, like I said, that that doesn't really, especially in fictional portrayals of the children of rich people, that doesn't happen very often. Yeah, to add add to that, well, you've just changed my view of him because in a minute, obviously, going forward, he's... uh, we're going to find out that Mr. Lee isn't into Sun because he's into somebody else. And I was, my note was Mr. Lee couldn't tell Sun was into, into him. What an idiot. But now you just made, I've thought deeper into that. And maybe it's because Mr. Lee really does love this, um, this woman that he met at university, that that's all he can see. He's clouded by his love for her. And that's probably why he missed Sun being into him because Mr. Lee was just looking for a way to, see this woman that he loved yeah um i do love the fact that he's uh telling her the embarrassing story about being uh well i wrote naked but pretty much you know he has he says he has the towel um in the hallway of one of his own hotels and then he does tell son he wants to keep seeing her but then he says that it's really only so that their parents won't pressure them anymore uh, he's, as you said, Andy, he's fallen in love with a girl from the States and he plans to move there, but hasn't told his father. He basically wants son to be his beard. Does that, you guys know what that is, right? I've never heard it used before, but I kind of get, get, the, get the gist of that analogy. <laughs> it's, it's a thing I that, think... that, um, back when it wasn't socially acceptable to be gay, that, uh, you know, gay guys would often get women to go out with them to parties or events, and it would be like, oh, this is, you know, this is my friend, or they would say it's their girlfriend so-and-so, and she would be considered their beard because it was, you know, oh, nobody will act, will suspect that I'm gay if I have this woman with me. Hmm. I'd never heard that before. Oh. Um... We can see the heartbreak slowly consume Sun's face when he says this to her. And then he realizes what she thought, which was that they were actually having a connection. But she's too embarrassed to stick around, and so she leaves. I felt bad for her. Oh, of course. Yeah. I totally understand what she's doing as well, going away. You wouldn't want to be stuck in that situation anymore if you both thinking different things about why you are together at that point yeah 
Um, in the jungle, Echo and Jin are still tracking Michael, and Echo comments how they, meaning the others, don't leave tracks. And then Echo hears something, and we get one of those awesome rotating camera shots, which I love, the 360 shot, before he shushes Jin. And then we see them hiding as feet walk along, uh, going past them. And this is the others. And I wrote, one of them appears to be a child, even carrying a little teddy bear like the Lost Boys from Peter Pan. Oh, this is fantastic. The thrill of seeing the others like this for the first time. I remember yeah. being exhilarating. I must have watched their feet back so many times, trying to find as much information about it as I could. And the, <laughs> teddy, bear just, and the, and the teddy bear just threw out so many more questions. It really made you think um, that all the others did was steal children. Um, and it was a terrifying thought, which was just great at this point to build up that mystery of the others. Who are they? Making us scared of any any potential opportunity we could encounter them in the send shivers down you think it's the others you get scared they deliver it well now do you guys ever did you ever sit uh because you guys all have it on dvd or blu-ray right um i know you know the how the dvd main menu like loops through a few times because it's it's like have you ever seen when if you let it go through x amount of times the feet start to walk past just like in that in that yeah. shot, and then there's a per- we don't see it in this episode, but we see somebody like the very last person kind of walking backwards, and they shuffle some things around, which lends to the theory that Echo just said about the fact that they don't leave tracks because they're shuffling things and moving things so that there are no no footprints or anything. No, didn't know that. But well, there you go. That's like, yeah. Um. Jin wants to go after them, but Echo confirms that they don't have Michael because they were coming from one direction and Michael was going the other direction. Um, and that he's that Michael is very lucky that he didn't encounter them. And Jin tells Echo to go back, but Echo refuses, which I thought was a nice thing because, as I said, I, I thought they kind of, even though it was through violence, they kind of shared that I, maybe I don't want to say a bonding moment, but I guess for lack of a better term, that's what I'll call it earlier. So just the fact that Echo is like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to leave this guy here alone. I thought that was pretty nice. Yeah, I think that was nice. Um, In flashback, Jin is asked by someone of a lower class if the man's son can use the bathroom. And Jin tried to fight it, but he's a good man. And so he lets them in. And then his manager approaches and chastises him for saying the kid, uh, and he chastises him for letting the, the, the man and his son in. And then he says that he should have let the kid piss in the street instead of going inside their fancy hotel. And after once again belittling the lower class, Jin has had enough, and he takes his, his fancy white gloves off, his nice hat, and he quits. Good on him. the senses. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't. I. I mean, I like the effect of the scene itself, what's just happened. But I don't. It's a scene that I really don't like watching. Um, that the whole Jin just getting talked down to the whole time. Him being a really nice person, letting these people, well, trying not to, but then letting them go for the toilet, and then he just gets completely shot down. I just don't really enjoy watching it. On the beach, Sun is joined by Kate. She and I wrote, she is popular in this episode. Of course, we we talked about it earlier. Um, and she says how it kind of, uh, I believe Andy said it earlier. She says how it is silly to be upset by such a material thing. However, I believe Andy said it again, how the fact that it is her only connection to Jin at this point. So it, it's, it is silly because it is just a thing, but it's like the one materialistic thing that she can have that still, like, reminds her of him. Yeah. I actually didn't... This whole conversation, I wasn't really listening to what they were saying because I was just so amazed that... And I had to write in my note about the people that um, she'd circled through. And we obviously we touched upon it already, but... 
It really was. It was Claire, Jack, Hurley, Locke, and now Kate. That's five main characters that Sun has had different... It's a bit of a weird episode. Like She's obviously looking for a wedding ring, and she's going through different people trying to find it. It was almost like a... I don't know. Like you can imagine that in like a children's TV show or something where they go through the characters, each one of them helping her along her journey a little bit further, try and find her ring. <laughs> I like that. I've never thought about it that way, but that's, yeah, I really like that. Um, and Sun actually then says that she's sick of everyone saying that Jin is all right uh, because she believes that he isn't. And then she says how Claire found the bottle of messages from the raft and Kate wants to see it, and Sun says that she buried it. This is a note I put here, and not obviously spoiler alert, this is where her ring is. I said, though, it because she says, I buried it. I thought to myself, she dug a hole in the sand with her bare hands. Please can someone tell me how this wasn't the first place to look when she lost her wedding ring. She's an idiot. <laughs> well, I don't know, because it's, it's the same basic thing. You know, like Hurley immediately latched on to maybe the dog ate it off of her hand. So it's not any different, I don't think. Uh, the thing is, I see this would probably be like the most eventful thing that she's done in the last few days. And it's probably yeah. the only thing that's in her mind the whole time is like, is Jin okay? There was a bottle that washed up on shore. Uh, that's probably all she's, that's probably what she's thinking about. The other thing she's thinking about compared to as well as her losing her wedding ring. So you'd have assumed that she could have maybe put one and one together and thought, oh, let's have a look over there. I guess, yeah. Um, with the tailies, Sawyer can't keep up, and Ana Lucia says that she'll leave him behind. And then he asks a rhetorical question that now that Echo, their tracker, is gone, how will they find the survivor's beach without him? And she, you know, says about how they'll walk along the beach or whatever. But she also makes it clear that she believes that Echo is coming back. And I said that Sawyer and Anna trade wits before he gets up and is ready to move. Because although it was humorous, I didn't necessarily think, like, you know, the whole, oh, are you married? Are you gay? Like, whatever. Just get up and, and let's move on. Oh, Paul, we're so different there. <laughs> I actually really enjoyed. It. I really enjoyed this scene. I thought it was genuinely funny. Um, the one time I found Annalisa's sarcasm and humor funny in this episode, like trying to leave him behind and then saying, "Are you gay?" I just, I just thought, I thought it was actually quite funny and light-hearted. I guess. Um, at a stream, Echo and Jin stop for water. Echo says that he has to go find the trail again, and then Michael appears to Jin, telling Jin to go back. And Jin chases after him as Michael yells, Walt. And he then yells that he doesn't care if the others hear him. He wants, uh, he wants the others to take him as well. And then Echo shows up and says that the others shouldn't be underestimated. Now, the one question I, I don't know if... I've ever voiced it to you guys, but the one thing that I've always kind of thought was, was interesting. Shouldn't cause they ask later on in the season when, when they've captured, uh, Michael, they ask him if Walt has always been special or whatever. Shouldn't realistically, shouldn't they have wanted him to, because it could have been a genetic thing. I don't think Michael and the others would play very well together. I don't think they'd be able to turn Michael to just want to live with them. You know what I mean? Like they could with like Cindy and people. Yeah. But still, I would think like if especially I don't want to they didn't necessarily do like experiments on Walt. That's not the way that I want to say it. But like they definitely had him in room 23 and they wanted to figure out stuff about him. I would think that, you know, if he whether he went along with it or not, that they would at least try to do the same thing with Michael just to see if it was, you know, if, if it was something genetic or whatever. Mm. But Michael has a small <laughs> breakdown before Jin assures him that they that he will find Walt. And Michael relents and goes back with them. On the beach, Sun is digging up the bottle and Kate wants to see the messages as she wants to believe that it isn't true, that it isn't actually the the message, you know, the bottle from the raft. 
she I, she's worried about Sawyer and she comments how she didn't get to say goodbye to him and she's upset and she looks down at the sand and she sees Sun's ring and Sun is so happy yeah I saw this happy Sun yeah it was, it was a happy moment but oh my moment mentioned here was that surely it's an engagement ring not a wedding ring because it's got a diamond on it yes this is true because i know this right now in in that culture i don't know if they they have the same way of doing things what sort of ring did you get autumn andrew so i got her a uh just a normal like yeah engagement ring she doesn't like diamonds because, uh, you know, she's she's watched Blood Diamond. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so um, we, I ended up getting her her favorite like gemstone. That's what she wanted. So she told me that from a long time ago. Did you propose before you had the ring? I can't remember. No, no, no. I had the ring. I had the ring all the, all through Asia. Yeah, and, that's, that's, I remember now. But I just never had found the time, and then actually. Funnily enough, I waited till I got back to England, and then that's when I asked. That's sweet. So, but for the wedding ring itself, we're just going to get a, like a plain band. So she'll have two rings, and I'll just have a, a plain gold band. Do you think you'll wear it? No, I'll wear it. Yeah, of course. I want everyone to know I'm married. Um, on the other side of the island, Jin is looking at his ring and thinking about Sun as well. And in flashback, we see a small bridge where Jin is walking and sees a woman in orange. He remembered what his roommate said and is distracted by her before turning around and bumping into Sun. And I said, I was at this location. Um, I liked it. I don't know about you guys, but I I liked it. I did like it. I just couldn't really feel... We we jumped out of there really quick, didn't we, after to take a picture? Yeah, it, it's, it was kind of like just in the middle of a day of visiting all of the lost locations. So, I mean, yeah, if, really stopped if, it was, if I spent one day to go to one location, that was the location, I probably would have taken more of it in. But I don't think I took much of it in and really appreciated it. In ter- and yeah. slash it was in the... I, I probably couldn't... I hadn't seen this episode in a while, so I only vaguely knew w- w- what the location was. Okay. Um, and then to close it out, we see, we see one final shot of Sun happy with her ring sitting next to Kate looking out at the ocean. And I just, I thought, I love that shot, behind, you know, where it's behind, the camera's behind them, and that's the last thing we see. That's two episodes, this one and the Everybody Hates Hugo episode. That's two episodes to kind of end on a happy note, which, of course, uh, the keen-eyed viewer should go, uh-oh, something, that means something bad's about to happen. <laughs> yeah, Michael Giacchino once again stuns us with his scores. Yep, it was an amazing piece of music. I was, he literally took the words out of my mouth, Andy. I was about to say that. His music, yeah. again, perfect for the moment. Um, but that's all I have <laughs> for the episode. Do you guys have anything else that maybe we may have missed? No, I would, will mention one thing, though. That did really surprise me when I read some episode notes afterwards on Lostpedia. That um, that for an episode like this, I'm not sure what was so important about it, but it was it was written by Damon Lindelof and Carlton Cuse, who are obviously the two heads behind Lost, who wrote well, who wrote the ideas behind the actual the actual creation and where the show was moving. And they only write like two or three episodes a season. And I was just very surprised. They normally write the premieres and the finales and the uh, maybe some important episodes in the middle. And I was just very surprised to see that they were the two writers of this episode. Uh, maybe that was why it was so good. I mean, I could tell you my theory, but, uh, you know. Yeah? What's your theory? Well, I know in TV writing... Um, more often than not, it tends to go in, uh, you know, like whoever's, if somebody's currently working on an episode, 
the writer's room will break it down and go, okay, let's come up with the basic things of this story. And then they'll give it to somebody, you know, oh, who hasn't written an episode in a while? Or if somebody really likes the the concept in particular, they'll let that that person have it. They go off and they write some drafts. So it might have just been a matter of everybody else was was busy working on certain stuff. Or maybe they wanted to be the ones to fully introduce the tailies because we def i mean we saw some of them in the everybody hates hugo episode we you know we got the whole uh you know oh there were 23 of them but we we get to see more of Ana lucia and echo and libby than we have so far this season so maybe they wanted to be the ones to kind of set the tone for them more in an episode yeah maybe that's not mm-hmm. bad that's not cool but yeah, that that's that's what I would say. So yeah, I think that might end it. Okay, so uh, uh, I want to try Ooh. to do maybe uh, the you know if everybody has their their put down the phone type moment. Do you guys happen to have one from this episode? Mine, mine would definitely be the the others walking through the jungle. Oh, yeah. and just see their feet. Yeah, that would have been um, fine. But Echo and Jin is it, just yeah. ridiculous. Yeah just off so many questions as well it's yeah. just amazing i love it is that the same for you then andy i think so yeah that is a great moment but i also really like that scene <laughs> with the, both the scene with jack and son and the scene with Locke and son i enjoyed them both of those scenes immensely watching them back this time because i know about the others i mean i know what the others are and it, it's almost a little bit ridiculous now watching that scene when you really know what the others are like but yeah, those scenes with Jack and Locke where, I've, I've said it so many times already in this episode, but just their lighthearted conversations where Jack has a smile on his face, Locke has a smile on their face, everything seems to be going all right. It's That's what I like watching. Andrew? Uh, I, yeah, I mean, I probably agree with the guys, but I don't really have a uh, a real standout moment, really. And, Andrew's I, 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 stressed from Desmond leaving. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so that's going to wrap us up. Um thank you guys for being on the show. Always love having you on here. Love being on Paul. Yeah, cheers Paul. Thank you. And well done Andrew again for being the Lost Quiz champion. Oh yeah, thank you. <laughs> um why don't you guys uh say your names once again and perhaps where anybody could follow you on social media if they maybe want to keep the conversation going. Yeah, you can, well, I, I say Facebook all the time, but basically just check me out on YouTube. I have my channel there with some Lost remixes. Um, and yeah, Facebook if you want to have a chat. I always have to talk about Lost. I'm available on Twitter at RTPC94. And if you want to find me on Facebook, if you find Andrew, you'll be able to find me very easily because I'm his younger brother. <laughs> and I'm not going to actually say to talk to me because... I've, been, I've done this twice and no one's reached out to me. So clearly no one has any interest in talking to me. <laughs> so I'm just going to say, I'll see you next time. I thoroughly enjoy it. Good night. <laughs> wow. Um, actually, uh, Andy, you said about your YouTube channel. I'm still waiting for you to put, um, I cannot remember the name of that song, but we had talked about it in, I think it was the season two premiere. It, you had East three, East two, 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 three, two, five, Yeah, waiting for you to put that one up. The problem here is I'm not actually that musically. I don't, I don't have that much musical talent. I just love electronic music. The problem is if I, I can't read music. So I say I don't, the only way I can remix that tune, I can play that tune is if somebody, like most of my early lost remixes are, um, I'm copying, I'm learning of some of a piano tutorial off YouTube, learning how to play the song. And then I play the song in um my in my production software that i use on my computer so unless i and because it's not a very well-known song and i can't read sheet music i can't really do it so what you're saying is you want to reach out to the lost fan base to say someone please translate it from musical uh composition into some form that you can that you can do so that you could then remix that song Basically, I need somebody to play it on piano and record a tutorial. Andrew, you should ask. You should ask Alison. She probably can. 
Yeah, she probably can, actually. Alice is my sister. Yeah, I probably should. You're right. Even mum can read music. Yeah. Well, there you go. Now there's no excuse. Um, all right, I think that's going to do it for us for the episode and found. Uh, this has been Lost with Friends, and I guess I will end it with the traditional thank you, namaste, and good luck. Namaste. Good luck. There's nothing left for me to say. <laughs> <laughs> I am going to go for a wee now, so just keep talking and I'll merge back in. Okay. Okay, so now it's Andy bashing time again. <laughs> yeah, good. <laughs> Arthur, you must have a lot of stories. <laughs> I was going to I was going to take the piss out of him earlier. But what were you going to say about him in school? Being a bit of a bit of a rebel as they call it. Yeah, he he does said that he was a bit of a rebel. Was he like, he's my, he's, my, he's, my he's gr- really popular. Yeah, no, he was, I think. I don't know. He might have just bullied people into him being popular. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to be like, oh, he, uh, I thought you were going to be like, oh, no, he, he just kind of put on a show for all of us. It was the same three friends just dressed up differently every time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what are you on about? And my, my day to school <laughs> were lots of pips. Is he back? Are you back? <laughs> Three friends all dressed up differently. <laughs> um, Michael then <laughs> asks... <laughs> no, 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 no. no. <laughs> you actually were bashing at me. I thought, when I left, I thought there was no way they were talking at me. Arthur says you were a bit of a bully at school. What? I was a bit of a twat. I just... I said rebel, and then I said he might have been a bully. I hope I wasn't a a joke. I hope I wasn't a bully. I was was a bit of a rebel. I was a twat to the teachers and stuff. Well, no, because what I said was because Arthur said that you were, you know, when when Andrew asked if you were popular, at first he's like, yeah, well, and (laughs) and uh, he said that he wasn't sure if you bullied, like you know, jokingly, he said he wasn't sure if you bullied people into being popular, and that's what I said. I thought he was gonna say that you just wanted to make yourself look better in front of your little brothers, so you actually only had three friends who just dressed up differently every time they came to your house. Yeah, basically, but my those three friends liked me so much that they were willing to dress up differently. So I think that's enough. (laughs) Hey, everybody, plenty more content on the channel, more to come soon. Check us out, like this video, subscribe to the channel, share us with your friends. Thanks.